All right, it's time to get started recording another radio broadcast today. We certainly are thankful for you folks that listen via our social media outlets. As always, we ask if you would like the video, share it for us. It would be a great blessing. Help us to reach many more folks. We thank you so much for that. All right, we're going to get started. Hey, man, well, let's get it back on the radio again today. We certainly do appreciate the good Lord allowing us to be able to come to you by means of radio. This is the Bear Trail Baptist Church broadcast. We certainly are privileged to be the pastor there, Brother Tim Krantz. We thank you folks so much for listening uh, to our radio broadcast and for letting us know that you listen to our broadcast. That is a great br- uh, blessing. All right, you can visit our church website if you'd like, BearTrailBaptistChurch.com. That website gives information in regard to our church, our service times, our church location, uh, what we believe, all kinds of stuff. There's messages on the website as well that you can listen to, recorded by myself and our assistant pastor and others who preach for us here at the church as well. And I'm sure that they will be a blessing and a help to you. All right, we're going to get started today. We concluded, well, actually we didn't conclude, but we stopped preaching in Psalms 15 on last week's broadcast. So we all probably had enough to do almost another entire radio broadcast from Psalm 6, uh, 15, but we're going to move on to Psalm 16 today, and hopefully the Lord will help us to be a help to you from this psalm as well. Let's pray together, ask the Lord to help us, and we'll get started in Psalm 16. Father, we love you. We thank you for loving us. Thank you for being so good to us. We ask you help us today to be a blessing, encouragement to your people. Use us, Lord, we pray, to speak the truth in love. Help us to do those things that bring honor and glory to your name. And Lord, we'll certainly thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Psalm 16, the heading of Psalm 16 said it is a mitzvah of David. Now, this is one of several mitzvah psalms. Uh, In fact, Psalm 56 through 60 are all mitzvah psalms. And this word means, mitzvah means to engrave. Or it has the idea of sculptured writing. It comes from a noun meaning gold. This psalm, this particular psalm, here is Psalm 16, that is referred to as a mitzvah of David, is also referred to as the golden psalm. What that means is, is the writing of the psalm is worthy of being written in gold. Now, there's a theme with these mitzvah psalms. All of these mitzvah psalms seem to end on a triumphant note. In fact, they end on a note that gives us the idea or preserves the idea of resurrection. Now, the setting or the background of this particular Psalm 16 is to believed or is believed to be at a time when David was fleeing from Saul. Now, of course, you read a lot about that in the Old Testament, especially in First and Second Samuel and so forth. But uh, it, David has been driven away from all of his... Uh, uh, material inheritance. We see that in 1 Samuel chapter 26, verse 19. And so this would be a psalm that would be read when a person is afraid or when a person is discouraged. In fact, the psalm is pretty much a very personal hymn of joy that focuses on the goodness of the Lord. In fact, the psalm is 14 times in 11 verses that make up the psalm. The personal pronoun, my, is used. It talks about my trust, my soul, my Lord, my goodness, my delight, my lips, my cup, my lot, my reins, my right hand, my heart, my glory, my flesh, my soul. And so it is a very personal, a very personal psalm, if you will. Now, the psalm is not only a mitzvah psalm. The psalm is also a messianic psalm. Uh, It has some prophetic references to the Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, Peter made mention of this psalm in Acts chapter 22 uh, when he was preaching on the day of Pentecost. And so, I mean, Acts chapter 2, verses 22 uh, through uh, 32. And uh, this, he, he said this psalm referred to Jesus and so did Paul. Paul also said that this psalm referred to the Lord Jesus Christ in his sermon in the synagogue at Antioch of Poseidon in Acts chapter 13, verses 28 through 37. So Psalm 16 is a mitzvah of David, and it is also a messianic psalm. We're going to read the psalm, only 16, uh, 11 verses. We may not read it all. And then we'll begin to share some things with you from the first verse 
uh, today on today's broadcast. The psalm says, Preserve me, O God, for in thee do I put my trust. O my soul, thou hast said unto the Lord, Thou art my Lord, my goodness extendeth not to thee. But to the saints that are in the earth, and to the excellent in whom is all my delight. I'll stop right there for the reading on today's broadcast. The first thing that we see in verse number one of this psalm is the preservation prayer of David. He said, Preserve me, O God, for in thee do I put my trust. Now, the word preserve means to guard. It means to keep watch, or it means to protect, if you will. And so David certainly understands that true peace and true security are not found in anything else other than the Lord Jesus Christ. Look, they're not found in our abilities. Uh, trust and peace or peace and security is not found in people. It's not found in money. It's not found in weapons. It's only found in God. Now, when David made this proclamation, in thee do I put my trust, he was not proclaiming some kind of last minute or some kind of spur of the moment decision. In fact, David's life had been built on the habit of putting his trust in the Lord. I tell you, I ask you, friend, is that your habit? Do you have a habit of putting your trust in the Lord? Or do you flounder around with every uh, inconsistency in life and every problem in life and every heartache in life and every, uh, every uncomfortable situation in life and every financial burden? Listen, the list could go on and on and on. And we can, we can, either, we can either lose sight of our hope and lose our peace and lose our security uh, in the things of God or we can continue to trust in the Lord. I promise you, very few of us, if any of us, have ever been through the many, many difficult situations and heartbreaks that David has been through. And yet, in spite of all of those difficulties in his life, he continued to put his trust in the Lord. Listen, friend, true faith does not call upon the Lord when trouble comes and then neglect Him when all is well and all is okay. True faith is a consistent, it's consistent in the good times and the bad times. We are faithfully trusting in the Lord. David here, in the beginning of this psalm, he is declaring that God is his refuge. I promise you, friend, you and I, we must make God our refuge as well. Now, listen, there's no one else, there's nowhere else to go. There's no one else to turn to. There's nowhere else to run to. There's no one else we can rely on other than the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, the Bible says in Psalm 9, in verse number 9, says the Lord also will be a refuge for the oppressed, a refuge in times of trouble. Psalm 46 and verse number 1, probably a, a, one of the most famous verses in the book of Psalms, it says, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Boy, a very present help. That means an exceeding and abundant help. I'm glad the Lord Jesus Christ can exceed our every need. I'm glad that His blessings upon you and I are abundant. So God is our refuge and strength. Now listen, David said, Preserve me, O God, for in thee do I put my trust. Now man, men, I should say, myself included, amen, by our very nature, we have a tendency to put trust in the wrong things. Oftentimes, when problems come or difficulties come in our life, if we're not careful, we will we'll trust in our own ability. We will trust in the ability of those who we know can meet the need that we have. We will trust in uncertain uh, uh, resources instead of trusting in the Lord. Now, here I'm going to list several things, maybe four or five things here, that men are often prone to trusting in other than trusting in the Lord. Here we go. First of all, some trust in their worth or their righteousness. They think that they're good enough or that they have done enough good deeds or that their life is pleasing enough to God that that'll get them through. But friend, the Bible says in Isaiah 64, verse number six, says, but we are all as an unclean thing and all our righteousness are as filthy rags and we do all fade as a leaf and our iniquities like the wind have taken us away. In other words, God says that our righteousness 
the things that do, we do right, the things that we are good at, the things that, that are upheld by others as being decent and moral and good, the Bible said that all of those things are as filthy rags. Now, I, I'm so thankful that I'm dependent on the Lord's righteousness and not my righteousness. Now, see, let me say, preacher, why is that? Well, let me just tell you this. We may see folks doing wonderful things. They, they may be living a life that is well-pleasing to God, and it is a great example to their neighbor and their, uh, their, their uh, church members and all of that kind of stuff. And those, listen, friend, I'm not making light of that. That is a great thing. But friend, we don't know the heart behind that. They could be doing that to receive the accolades and the pats on the back of men. They could be doing those things in order to enhance their social status or, or their financial gain or any such thing. We have no idea the heart motive behind what people does. And so Lord knows that man by his very nature is rotten to the core. And there's nothing at all good about you and I except for the Lord Jesus Christ. And so we can't be, we can't be putting trust in our own worth. We can't be putting trust in our own righteousness. The Bible says that it is as filthy rags. And here's the second thing. Some trust in their works. Now, this is closely related with the previous point. I understand that, talking about their worth or their righteousness. But the Bible says in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse number 8 and 9, uh, some of the most memorable verses in the Bible again. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Now, verse number nine says this, not of works, lest any man should boast. See, friend, if we were able, we are not. I want you to understand that. If we were able to acquire salvation and eternal life by our works, and we are not, amen, I want you to get that. But if we could, we would boast about it. And the Lord understands that. that. That salvation is offered to us by the grace of God, by us put, placing our faith in the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ. And then we are given the gift of salvation, the gift of eternal life. And it's not by works. We can't earn it. We can't, uh, we can't do enough good works to acquire it. We can't. A lot of folks have this idea. A lot of folks teach that you're saved by grace through faith, but then you have to work to keep yourself saved. Friend, you've done away with the gift. You've done away with the grace of God. You, you have done away with the fact that it would not have works lest any man should boast. In fact, in that very passage of Scripture, God said, you are proud. And those people who think that they're living good enough or well enough to stay saved or that they're doing enough good works to keep their relationship and their salvation in touch with God, I'll tell you what those folks are, friend. They are proud because I, I understand and I realize that all of my righteousness is filthy rags and I have never done anything to merit or deserve the favor of of our God. And so David understood that as well. He said, preserve me, O Lord, for in thee do I put my trust. So some are trusting in their worth or their righteousness. Some are trusting in their works. Some put their trust in their wealth. You see, the Bible says, the Bible says in Psalm 49, verse number six, it says that they that trust in their wealth and boast themselves in the multitude of their riches, None of them can by any means redeem his brother, nor give to God a ransom for him. So the Bible tells us here that those that trust in their wealth, man, they, they may be boasting themselves in the multitude of their riches, but I promise you this, not a single one of them has enough to redeem his brother. It doesn't matter how, he may be the wealthiest man in the world, but you can't buy the favor of God. It's not for sale, amen. You'll never be able to redeem one of your loved loved ones from sin. You'll never be able to redeem one of your friends from an eternal punishment in the lake of fire by your wealth, amen. And listen, there, there's not enough for you to redeem a loved one, and there's not enough to pay God a ransom for yourself. Listen, friend, God's not interested in our wealth as far as it making us righteous. Now, the Bible says in Psalm 52, and verse number 7, the Bible says, this is the man that made not God his strength. 
but trusted in the abundance of his riches. Now here's what happens when you do that. I'm going to read the remainder of the verse. And strengthened himself in his wickedness. Listen, friend, God makes it very clear that we are not to trust in riches. In fact, if we're trusting in anything other than the Lord, other than the Lord Jesus Christ, we're trusting in anything other than our God, our Savior, then we are strengthening our own wickedness. That's exactly what the Bible said. This man, that uh, this is the man that made not God his strength. So, uh, he, you know what the Bible says in Romans 5, 6? I believe it's Romans 5, 6. It talks about we're, we don't have enough strength to get our knit ourselves to God. I was going to quote that verse and it left my mind just like that. But uh, anyway, we, we don't have enough strength to get ourselves to God. We have no strength in our wealth, in our riches, in our works, or any of those things at all. And uh, we can't trust in our abundance. We have to put our trust and our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. He strengthened himself, the Bible says, in his his wickedness when he puts trust in anything other than the Lord. In fact, the Bible says in the New Testament, Paul writing to Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 6, he says, charge them that are rich in this world that they be not high-minded nor trust in uncertain riches. So Paul told Timothy, he said, look, you have some parishioners, they're wealthy. I'm not condemning them because they're wealthy, but I want you to remind them that don't be proud. First of all, they, they better not be high-minded because you wouldn't have any wealth. You wouldn't have any riches if it were not for God allowing you to acquire that. He either allowed you to inherit it or he allowed you to have the mind and the wherewithal to earn it. He either puts you in a position or a place that you could have not obtained on your own that you might be able to acquire that wealth. And so he said, be not high-minded. Then he said this, nor trust in uncertain riches. So we're not to trust in those things. We're to trust in the living God who giveth us richly all things to enjoy. Now, there's a couple of things in this passage. We are, first of all, admonished to not trust too much in the riches because they are uncertain. Listen, friend, I, I wish no ill will to you, toward you at all whatsoever. None. I promise you I don't. Listen, friend, we're living in a very unstable world, and even riches are uncertain. Listen, we're, we're living at a time when it seems that, that our nation is drifting toward a, uh, a global nationality, a global nation, and when that happens, uh, the, the wealth and the riches and the financial institutions in America as we know it are certainly going to be uncertain riches. Listen, friend, just any day, that, that pile of money that you may have or may not have, I don't know. It could be, it could very well be worthless in just a few hours, amen. And so there, uh, you cannot put your faith and your trust in uncertain riches. Instead, we are to trust in the living God who gives us all things to enjoy. You see, David, David here, he, in fact, in this particular psalm, I believe he's writing about the fact that he has been driven away from all of his material and inheritance. And he says, preserve me, O Lord, or preserve me, O God, for in thee do I put my trust. David had to leave his homeland. He had, to, he had to leave his wealth. He had to leave his possessions. But yet he didn't have to leave God. And so he wasn't trusting in those other things. He was putting his trust in his Savior to be his protector. So some trust in their worth, some trust in their works, some trust in their wealth, and some trust in their weapons, amen. Now, you know what the Bible says about that? The Bible says in Isaiah 31 and verse number 1, it says, Woe to them that go down to Egypt for help, and stay on horses, and trust in chariots, because they are many, and in horsemen, because they are very strong. But they look not to the Holy One of Israel, neither seek they neither seek the Lord. You know, the Bible says in Psalm 44, verse number six, for I will not trust in my bow, neither shall my sword save me. Listen, friend, 
an abundance of artillery, an abundance of, of horsemen, an abundance of soldiers, if you will. They may be very strong, and they are, and thank God for a strong military. I'm, I'm for all of those things. I wish we had a stronger military. I wish we, our nation was more uh, inclined to doing what is, uh, is, is pleasing to God, and, and our nation was more inclined to closing our borders and protecting our own. And all. I, listen, I'm for all of that stuff. I'm not against weapons, amen. I understand that uh, as cruel and, and as horrible as war is, it is sometimes a necessary evil. Now, some of you, some of you hate me now. I understand that. But listen, friend, I, I'm not against weapons. In fact, I probably have too many of them. But I promise you this, I've never prayed for those weapons to protect me. I've never prayed for those weapons to provide for me. I've never prayed for them to deliver me. My trust is in the Lord. Amen. And David said that my trust is in the Lord. So some trust in weapons. Listen, some folks trust in Washington. Well, that's a joke, isn't it? But it's happening. Boy, it's really happening now. And and, and I listen, I'm, I'm not going to get political. I'm not going to get involved in politics and all of that. I, I vote and I think you ought to as well. I think you ought to follow biblical principles when you vote. And I think you ought to exercise your right to do that. But that's not the meaning of my message today. I'm telling you this. Some folks trust in Washington. You know what the Bible says? The Bible says in Psalm 146 and verse number 3, Put not your trust in princes, nor in the sons of man, in whom there is no help. Did you hear that? The Bible says, Put not your trust in princes, nor in the son of man, in whom there is no help. Help. Listen, friend, ultimately, man, whether he be a prince or no, is not going to be able to help you. We must have our trust in the Lord. You know, the Bible says in Psalm 118, verse number 9, it is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in princess. Listen, we, we need to put our faith, we need to put our trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible says in Jeremiah 17, verse number 5, thus saith the Lord, Cursed be the man that trusteth in man, and maketh flesh his arm, and whose heart departeth from the Lord. Listen, friend, we better put our trust in God. The Bible said here that cursed be the man that trusteth in man. I'm not trusting in man in this upcoming election. I'm trusting in the Lord. I'm not trusting in man to provide my needs for today. I'm trusting in the Lord. I'm not trusting in man to provide my needs tomorrow. I'm trusting in the Lord. I'm not trusting in man to provide my needs next week or next year. Should I live to see any of those times, my trust will continually be in the Lord. It's not been man that's gotten me to this point. It's been God. It'll not be man that gets me home to glory. It'll be the Lord. David said, I am in a horrible place. I am in a terrible situation. I am without all of my inheritance. I am away from everything that I I have, but God, you preserve me because it is in you that I am putting my trust. And so first of all, in verse number one, we see the preservation prayer of David. Now in verse number two, we see the perception and praise of David. You see in verse number two, he said, Oh, my soul, thou hast said unto the Lord, thou art my God. So David says here, we'll talk, thou art my Lord. We'll talk about the latter part of that verse. We won't have time today. We won't even get through this part of the verse on today's broadcast. But David says, Thou art my Lord. Now listen, this statement brings us to a couple of good questions. First of all, who or what is the Lord of your life? Now let me say this before you answer that question. Something or someone has the preeminence in your life. I don't know what it is, friend. And uh, you may have not given it much thought, but there is something or someone in your life who is a priority. David said, O my soul, thou hast said unto the Lord, thou art my Lord. Listen, I hope the Lord has the preeminence in your life. I hope he's not some crutch that you lean on when you need help. 
I hope that he's not some, someone you keep in the closet because you're ashamed of him until someone in your life that's dear to you needs some help. Then you run and open the closet and try to get him out and, and say a prayer. No one knows anything about the fact that you care anything about God at all because of your wicked, drunken, adulterous, fornicating lifestyle. And then you want to pull God out of the closet because you need something. Listen, friend, some Something or someone is Lord of your life. I hope the Lord Jesus Christ has the preeminence in your life. Listen, friend, if he does not have the preeminence in your life, then how can you make Jesus Christ the Lord of your life as an individual? Let me ask you some questions. First of all, how do you make Christ Jesus the Lord of your life? First of all, you've got to be saved. You see, the Bible says making Christ your Lord begins by trusting Him as your personal Lord and Savior. Listen, you must invite Him into your life and heart and trust Him to take you to heaven when you die. The Bible says in Romans 10, 13, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Listen, friend, we have so degraded and cheapened the gospel in the day that we live in that we are expecting folks to trust Christ and be saved saved, having no idea who God is or who the Lord is. Listen, friend, he is the sacrifice that paid the price and the penalty for your sin. He is a holy God and a righteous God and one who that is willing and ready and able to save you if you'll put your faith and your trust in him. Friend, he is a God who never had any desire, any, any thought or any bent towards sin. And in fact, in spite of your sin, he still loves you. Hey, the Bible says in Romans 5 and verse number 8, But God commendeth his love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So listen, friend, you recognize your sinful condition. You understand the fact that because of your sin, you've been separated from God. That separated for separation for God, should you die in that state, is a prescription for hell. Then one day, friend, you'll be raised from hell to stand at the great white throne judgment, and you'll be cast into the lake of fire and outer darkness for all eternity. Simply, friend, because you refuse to believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ for salvation. You see, friend, he who is without sin, he died upon the cross of Calvary bearing your sin. They placed him in a borrowed tomb. Three days later, he got up out of that tomb, victorious over death, hell, and the grave, so that you and I could place our faith and our trust in the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ, and we could be saved. Listen, friend, folks have this mentality that we are all the children of God. No, we are all creation of God. He is the creator. You didn't evolve from, from, from some monkey. You didn't evolve from some tadpole. You would want some single cell to meme us sometime back millions of years ago. No, God created man and he breathed into man the breath of life. And ever since that time he created Eve to be Adam's uh, wife and, and they began to create or, or procreate the world, friend. And so you are a creation of God, but you're not a child of God until you are born again. You see, Jesus told that religious leader back in John chapter 3, Nicodemus, he said, you must be born again. Then he said again, marvel not that I say unto thee, you must be born again. Preacher, what does it mean to be born again? Well, uh, Nicodemus asked a silly question. Can we enter into our mother's womb and be born a second time? No, friend. That's not what he's talking about. First of all, you were born to the water. That's the natural birth. Now we need a spiritual birth. We need to be saved, friend. And the Bible tells us when we call upon the Lord Jesus Christ for salvation and we receive him, the Bible says in John 1 and verse number 12, and as many as received him, to them gave he the power to become the sons of God. And so we receive the Lord Jesus Christ as the means of our salvation, our sacrifice for salvation, our Savior. We receive Him that is a spiritual birth. We receive the Spirit of God that will never leave us or forsake us. What a blessing that is. And we become a son of God. So first of all, first of all, and this is as far as we'll get today, if you want to make Jesus Christ the Lord of your life, you'll have to be saved. And friend, if you're not saved, it was mentioned in a revival meeting I was in last night, you can't revive something that is dead. You got to be born again, amen. You got to trust Jesus Christ as your personal Savior so that you can 
be saved. Listen, our time is quickly coming going today as it always as it always does every broadcast. But we're so thankful that you tuned in today, and we do hope that you'll tune in again next week at the same time. And until then, may God bless is our prayer. All right, thank you so much for watching on social media. It's a blessing you folks listen in. I hope you'll like and share the broadcast. There's no way we can reach as many people as we'd like to without your help. And we thank you so much for doing that. All right, good day. God bless.